So, hello. So, where is everybody from? I know Ukraine. We had dinner today, yesterday. Germany? Italy. Italy, okay. Croatia, it's probably obvious. Where else? Norway. Norway, nice. Slovakia, Slovakia okay. Poland. Poland. Very nice. So, um, I hope you can put up with what we Germans call speaking English. <laughs> I'm Stefan. I'm glad to win over the beach and the pool, but we'll have, we'll have some fun with regards to the pool in a couple of minutes. So let's get through the boring introduction, which I'm basically going to skip most of it because um, I want to get coding. So um, once this thing starts to work, this is me. I'm basically a PHP consultant um, helping people to build good software with PHP and to maintain software based on PHP. Um, I'm coaching teams. I have written, I think, uh, more, about half a dozen books or so. I do university lectures on web programming, which I think should be done more at universities. And I'm also a scalability expert, which basically means I'm a father of twins and they are back there listening into the beginning and they're going to get bored at some point because they don't speak English. So it's, Everything I'm saying does not make sense to them, but that's probably normal. <laughs> uh, this is the company I'm, I'm working for. is um, one I co-founded with Sebastian Bergmann and Arne Blankatz. And we have clients, and I'm not going to bore you with all that because you can read up on that on the internet. But this is uh, an ebook that we've created as PHP 7 came out. The, the interesting thing about this is um, it's kind of a living document. So whenever there is an update to PHP 7, we are going to update the book and you're going to get free updates. And of course, I have a discount code for you. So if you're interested in the book, check it out. Um, while the conference goes on, you can use the WebSC 2018 discount code and you'll get 25% off. And one more boring commercial. I'm actually working on a book called Event Sourcing Explained, which is going to Surprise, ex <laughs> explain event sourcing. Um, and you can, it's not yet there, I'm, I'm working on it and I'm basically, as of now, that's a mailing list where you can register and I will not spam on you but uh, keep you posted about the progress of the book. So if you're interested in that, visit this website um, and sign up to my probably not GDPR compliant mailing list. Um, speaking about the pool, who's been down in the pool? That's one of the advantages of being a speaker. You get to hang out at the pool, but then you sit by the pool and work on the slides. So actually, um, I'm, I'm pretty stupid, um, and I was under the impression that I have a full day workshop here, and then they told me, yeah, you got three hours. Okay, so and I have to squeeze a full day into three hours. That's gonna be interesting. That's why I'm actually showing some slides, um, but we'll soon get into coding. So. Talking about the pool, if you want to hang out at the pool, this is what you need. That's called a sunbed. Um, and if you have ever traveled somewhere where German people are on vacation, legend has it that Germans get up very early in the morning and put a towel on the sunbed to keep it reserved for them. I'm not really sure if that works out if you have a hotel towel that all look the same. But that's a different story and we're actually going to deal with that on a technical level in a few minutes. So this is what Guardian has to say about that. Um, they are the most loathed figures on holiday, the stealthy shadows creeping through the dawn light armed with little more than a telltale swath of fabric over one arm heading inexorably towards the line of poolside sun loungers. And they continue saying, every British holiday maker is convinced that the culprits are the dastardly Germans. Allegedly, the Germans think that the British are the ones that put the towels there. And somebody even suggested blaming the French, but that did not really work out. So, 
with every problem that doesn't make sense in the first place, there is somebody trying to come up with an IT solution to that problem. As of this year, with a favorite well-known German travel agency, you can actually online choose and pre-register your sunbeds. <laughs> Not every hotel offers that, and I'm really not sure whether it makes sense in the first place, but it exists and there is an app for that. So, um, looking for an example that is simple enough so that it can fit into one or two hours of live coding, this is actually what I came up with, and we're gonna play around a little with uh, this and see if we can write um, code that allows us to reserve sunbeds. That's pretty stupid, I know. But examples always have to be a little stupid so that everybody understands the basic business logic around it. So, um, and this is the first segment, which is probably going to go until the coffee break. And after the coffee break, there is uh, going to be some work for you guys to do. So I have two repos prepared, the one that I'm going to work in now, and then the other one that um, should be in your VM, and I have all the information coming up with a very, very nice um, TDD coding exercise for you guys. And I'm going to go walking around and breathe down your neck, so everybody's surely going to enjoy each other. All right, um, so let's do some live coding. I'll switch over to my favorite IDE, and I never ever advertise commercial software with the only exception of PHP Storm, because ever since I started using it, I don't know how, how I could have possibly worked without that before. I hope you share this feeling. Uh, that's the wrong window. So I have a, I have a repo, and basically, what I have here is an SRC folder and a tests folder and just some very, very minimal infrastructure to run PHP unit and to build an auto load map, which is currently empty because obviously there is no code. And now what I'm trying to do is, um, I'm trying to show some techniques and things that I would do and do some explaining as I code. I would invite you to ask as many questions as you like whenever you have a question. Just interrupt me, and we can um, discuss that. Um, and I hopefully will soon get into trouble and start debugging, which hopefully then will motivate us to actually write tests or even write tests first. So that being said, um, who regularly does test-driven development? Okay, most of you have come to the right place. Um, who has tried it out before? Who's never done it? Okay, great. So that's a good mix. Um, I'm, I hope I will be able to um, introduce you to the whole concept in a non-scary way. So um, let's talk about sunbeds, right? Um, one of the things that I'm trying to hint at while we are progressing is, as developers, we have been trained over years and years, and we have trained, even trained the business to focus on data, right? The data model is the most important thing. Thus, the database is the most important thing. So the first thing we need to do is create a data model. And that's not quite right. Um, there may be some cases and some applications where this makes sense, but generally, um, you want to stay away from data modeling as long as you can. And one of the reasons why I picked that example is because I'm hoping to show to you that it's much more interesting to focus on the state of objects, and it's even more interesting to focus on the transition of the state, so the state transitions of objects. And the storing of data and the persistence, we are not going to cover in this workshop, we are just going to ignore it. So basically, we're going to create some objects that can do some things, and then at the end of the request, they'll just die. And we don't really care about that, because persistence technically is a separate problem, and our main focus today will be the business logic. So um, 
you will get access to that repo and I would actually suggest to you to not go along because I keep changing things around. So just sit down and watch. I'm going to commit every once in a while so you will have the history of the project. That being said, please remind me to commit because I tend to forget that as I tend to forget the coffee break. So please somebody remind me when it's time for the coffee break. Um, yes, sunbeds. So let's discuss a sunbed. Now I have learned that it's a very, very good idea to visualize what you're discussing. So that's a sunbed, sort of. And that's somebody. And this person wants to use the sunbed. So how does, wh wh what decisions are going to take place now? So can I use that sunbed? Depends, Depends on what? If it's free. So if there is somebody lying on there, unless that's your wife, you'll probably not want to sit on that one. Okay. So it can be taken. Then um, there could be a towel on it. And it could be free. Well, does that mean I can take it? Maybe. You see, it's pretty difficult, actually. So the decision, whether it's free or taken, well, is at least not binary, as you might expect, like having a Boolean flag, it's taken, yes or no. No, you can't do that. So there is a difference. There could be a person on it, and there could be a towel on it, there could be nothing on it, there could be a very mean person, like very strong, next to that. And as soon as you want to try to lie there and say, hey, that's reserved for my wife. Um, so it's also taken. There are various ways of um, realizing that the sunbed is taken. Um, maybe we can put like a sign there. This is technically what those guys doing the app will do. It's, they're going to put a sign there with your room number 107. This is not my room number, but just an arbitrary number. It's too small for you to read anyway. Okay, so um, let's try to model that. And again, I'm deliberately not doing test-driven development. I'm just doing, well, some people might call it cowboy coding, whatever. Let's just see if we can get something done. So usually what you want to have is... Um, Probably a sunbed. And um, we'll certainly need some script that we can run. Let's call it test PHP. And test PHP will require. No. SRC. Oops. We require the auto loader and then we can use the sunbed. And let's just add a var dump there for now. So this should give us a sunbed. Um, test PHP. No, sunbed not found. That's because I did not generate the auto loader no that's dump auto loader right yes so i have that small shell script dump auto loader which just runs a little tool called php ab which is php auto load builder i like that tool very much because it generates that very straightforward and minimal auto loader which is capable of loading the sunbed well, technically, uh, you can do a similar thing with Composer. Uh, I think this is just a little more slim and lean, so I actually like using that one. Okay, but that's personal preference. So we have a sunbed, and our sunbed can't do anything, but it's there. Okay, so what, what's the next step? We can, we can try to figure out those states of taken and whatever. 
we can start looking at transitions. Maybe how does a sunbed um, get reserved, maybe by putting a towel on that. Well, great, so maybe we need a towel that we can put on the sunbed. Okay. Um, when, I, when I code for demo, I tend to put stuff in one file. Don't worry, I'll split it out later. It's just easier to type everything in one file versus flipping back and forth between the tabs. So we need a towel and um, obviously I can reserve a sunbed with a towel. Does that make sense? Okay, let's see. So we need a towel. Um, the sunbed um, we need to reserve. Reserve with the towel. Okay, so class towel, yeah, I tend to forget that, so let's dump the autoloader. Okay, well, we have a sunbed. And since the application did not crash, it obviously has worked, which is a very weak condition. So maybe we want to improve on that. Um, so how do we find out whether the sunbed is reserved? Yeah, well, maybe we can ask the sunbed whether it's reserved, right? And I can add that method. I can fake the stuff in here for a moment. So clearly the sunbed is reserved now. It's reserved by a towel. Okay. Um, Funny enough, I don't really do anything here, so if we are not calling the reserve with method, it's still reserved, which is kind of wrong. So, well, maybe we'll have to fix that. So, if there is a towel, then let's have a towel here. Let's create a private towel field, which is a towel, so, oops. That's a towel. I'm not using namespaces just to keep things simple. In a regular project, always use namespaces. I just want to avoid any extra complexity so that we can focus on interesting aspects. Um, so I'm not going to use namespaces. And return... Will that work? Yeah, obviously. Now if we change it and do not reserve the sunbed, then, well, it's not reserved. Great. Now we can go back and forth between that. And um, if you give this to your coworker or your boss, and you're going to say, you know, you just run the test PHP, and if it says bool true, then everything is all right. That's a bit of a problem, right? Because somebody has to understand what bool true means, which we basically only can do by looking at the source code. So this code is not self-testing. Actually, the way I'm working here, and I have always worked that way even before there was unit testing, when I was a little boy going to university and stuff. Um, I always had this test script, and I was writing a little code, and I was executing the test script, and I would, was happy if things worked out. The problem is that even with this very, very simple example, we already have two different execution paths, like it cannot be reserved, it can be reserved, and we have to flip back and forth, or we have to copy and paste the blocks, and then we have basically a script that says true, false, and we have to deduct that everything works out, which is kind of bad. Well, this is obviously where automated testing comes into place, because that, with a little more effort, we can write as PHP unit tests. And we can keep them. And we can run them, and there is a beautiful infrastructure of running all those tests. So it gets much more convenient because we don't have to interpret the results. Plus, we are not throwing the script away. 
because this script is probably going to go away in a couple of minutes as we move on and put the persons on the sunbed, whatever. We're probably not going to keep that code. So, okay, let's try and formalize that. So, he, who is working with a PHP unit or a similar X unit testing tool on a regular basis? Okay, less than half, so I'm going to take a few minutes to, to go through that for all the others. So I'm going to create a PHP file. I'm not, I know the IDE can theoretically create a test, but for whatever reason that does not work on my system. So I'm going to do it manually. Um, and that's a sunbed test. And the sunbed test is class sunbed test. There are very few conventions that you have to stick to. And basically it's just conventions, but sticking to them makes things work out of the box, so that's brilliant. You're extending PHP HP unit. Right. It used to be like that. That's old versions of PHP unit. PHP unit is so old it was created before namespaces even existed and then at some point namespaces got introduced so now um, you should do it like that and if you have I have a PHP unit far in my project directory so the IDE should be able to um, give me autocomplete we'll see in a, in a bit and so I postfix the class name with test. And the file name should match the class name. And it's sun. I screwed that one up, so let me fix that quickly. Sunbed test. Um, so your test has a name that ends in test, and your test method has a name that starts with test. And if you then run PHP unit on that, which I can just do by um, running PHP unit, I have a small shell script, which is, well, actually, that's just an alias to the PHP unit far. Um, and then what PHP unit is going to do, let me clear that, um, it's going to go through the tests directory, and it's going to look for all the classes that end in test, and inside those classes, it's going to look for all the methods that start with test, and it's going to execute them. And the thing is, all those tests are executed in isolation, so each test gets a fresh environment. We want test isolation. We don't want tests to move state from one test to another, because then suddenly the sequence in which we execute the tests matters, and we really don't want to depend on that. And technically, what PHP unit tells us is there is a risky test. A risky test is a test that did not perform any assertions, so it's an empty test. Okay, it's not a failure, it's not wrong, but um, it's incomplete. Right, so now we have to test something. Let's create, well, let's actually move the code over from here. We already have that, right? Let's just move that into the test and um, replace that var dump. Actually, I can execute the same code, and there's the var dump. And then PHP unit is still complaining that there are no assertions. If I add an assertion, then it's going to complain that there is going to be output. Let's do that. This assert true sunbed is reserved. Okay. Now assert basically says this needs to be true, otherwise the test fails. Now the, it complains that the, the test prints output. Well, we don't need that output anymore because now the test is green, is passing, and what we have done now is basically with pretty much exactly the same piece of code, we have put the knowledge of how to interpret the result into executable code. So now you don't have to tell your boss, if that says true, then it's okay, because after two months you don't remember that. Now this clearly says, well, if we reserve a sunbed with a towel, then the, towel, then the sunbed has to be reserved. Hmm. Okay, we can have fun in creating more tests, and you will agree with me that the test name still sucks. That's something that we're going to fix quickly in, in, in a few minutes. But for now, 
let's just create meaningless tests. I do things not perfectly initially so that we run into certain problems so that we can see what these problems are and then we learn why we want to avoid those things in the first place, right? So if we do not reserve the towel, then obviously this needs to be false, right? And the IDE tells me, yeah, we don't even need a towel if you're not going to put it on the sunbed. So that's another test. And, whoa, it's green, great. So obviously it works. Um, now, still a very simple example, but let's assume that for whatever reason we make a mistake as we change, refactor, or modify the code, right? What will happen now? Two tests were failed. Failed asserting that false is true uh, in something and failed asserting that true is false in something too that basically tells me nothing. I have to look at the source code to understand that. So maybe we can come up with better test names. Let's try to get more descriptive here. I guess this is, is not reserved, right? If, if you create a sunbed out of the void, if God creates a sunbed, I'm not trying to be blasphemic here. If, if, if somebody creates a sunbed, um, it's gonna be empty by definition. Do I have an indentation problem here? Yes, I had. So, initially is not reserved and um, can be with a towel. And both of those don't work. Um, but now, it's, it gets more descriptive and tells you which features are broken. Well, obviously, still you have to look into the source code and let's fix it quickly and the tests are back to green. So, let me do some quick refactoring. I think I need this. Move the class. I like F6 a lot because this allows me to move those classes to separate files and then I have to dump an autoloader and then we can run PHP unit again. And all is still, tests are still green. Cool. So let's add some more features, right? Let's bring in that fat guy or that guy up there, which is me or whoever, a person. Is it a person? Can we find a better term than person? A guest? Yeah, maybe a guest. I like guest. Okay, guest. A guest, well, what can a guest do? A guest can actually sit on the sunbed, right? Let's see if we can model that. Um, Let's occupy the sunbed by the person. Um, we'll do the same thing like we did with a towel. The person. Ah, thank you. It's, good, it's great if you stick to your own namings but luckily the IDE is really clever in suggesting that. Okay, so, thanks. It's a guest, okay. Um, and it doesn't break the towel behavior, but it's still untested, so we need more tests, right? It can be occupied. Well, test can be occupied, oops, can be by guest. So in that case, we have a guest and we have a sunbed. I'll copy paste that. And then the sunbed, we can occupy by the guest. Now, 
we need to be able to ask the sunbed whether it's occupied, probably, right? This assert true sunbed. is occupied. This method doesn't exist. As I don't know if you can see the highlighting. Yes, you can see. It's really bad on my screen. Um, and I can just create that method. And it's probably pretty much the same like that one. Is that just me or are we hearing music? Music from that side, other speaker from that side. That's really, that's what you call stereo, huh? <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's a green test, obviously, that works. And we can still uh, make sure that initially the sunbed is not occupied. Sunbeds usually do not come with guests on them, right? Let's see. Yeah, works. Now, even with that simple sunbed thing, we, we already have a bunch of execution paths, which you technically always have if something has a return value. So in good PHP 7 tradition, let's add those. Who's, um, who's already working with PHP 7? Okay, I, I hope all the others have serious plans of upgrading. Because <laughs> it's the only supported PHP version that exists. Officially supported by the PHP project, that is. Okay, um, so that's actually still pretty simple code and a bunch of tests. And now, what I like about that, um, we can have a conversation now. And we can have a conversation using the terminology that we've used here, and it doesn't have to be a technical um, conversation like talking about database columns or weird things uh, like controllers or services or whatever. But for example, a viable question might be, well, so if a sunbed is occupied, would that also qualify as being reserved? Why? Occupied means that uh, someone is on that uh, sunbed. Okay. Reserved is uh, some kind of uh, possibility to have this sunbed. Okay, yeah. I think I can agree to that. And it technically it can be occupied and reserved. And can be uh, can be occupied but not reserved. So there is, uh, even with those two Boolean kind of flags, we already get a bunch of possibilities. So if it's not reserved and it's occupied, when you, you can leave it and somebody else can take it. If you have your towel on it, as you go, it's still, it's still reserved. So clearly those are two separate things. From a convenience point of view, we might want to add a method at some point um, saying, can I use that sunbed? Right? I don't care whether it's occupied or reserved or whatever. If I can use it, go, go lie down. Otherwise, I'll just go on to the next one. So maybe there is like a convenience method saying, well, it's either if it's not occupied and not reserved, feel free to take it. Yeah. If it's reserved, well, can I only take it if I have reserved it? No, I mean, if uh, the sunbed is reserved and it's reserved by not you, ah. you cannot. Okay, you have, just, you have just defined the next test case. Now let's, for the fun of it, let's try to write the test first and see what happens. Can you, can you repeat what you just said? And let's condense this into the name of a test. You see that I'm, the, the way I'm naming the tests, that's a little weird, those sentences. With regular methods, um, you would probably not want those long um, like sentences. 
uh, the reason why I'm doing that is PHP unit has this nice test docs switch, which basically just does some, um, adds some spaces when the capitalization changes and gives you this. Well, I like to call that an executable specification. So it tells you exactly what the sunbed can do and cannot do. And this is something that you can put into a wiki or it's a built artifact that you can stick somewhere and you can discuss it with business. Because it should be not technical. It's, well, a sunbed can be reserved with a towel. Yes, I understand that. There is no need to be, you know, dealing with any technical terms like queue or database or whatnot. I can understand that. So um, this is why it makes sense to have those sentences because they expand to something that's very, very readable, which in essence is a lot of what BDD is about. Um, okay, so let's try to write the test first. Okay, sunbed test. You said if I, if it's, if I have reserved it, then only I can take it. Can, I don't, I think we can be more specific. I think what I understood that you said is, and I have a very long sentence, um, when I have not, is, is that what we are talking about? Okay, so um, let's, let's try to get more concise on that. A and the fun thing is, what we are doing here seems like spending too much effort in finding a name, but in fact is getting really clear on what we are actually going to test, aka what we are going to build. And this is a large part of what makes you successful as a developer if you do TDD is exactly that thought process because it gives you a very clear focus on what you need to do next and this is only going to be a very, very small piece of code, hopefully. Okay, so, um, guest who reserved sunbed can occupy it. Right? Okay, so we need a guest. And we need a sunbed. I'll, I'll steal that from here. And we also need a towel because we need to occupy, uh, we need to reserve it. So we have a guest, a towel, and a sunbed. Now, we reserve the sunbed with a towel. And then we'll occupy it. And at the end, it needs to be occupied, which is pretty much the same as this test, but I'm not concerned with that right now because it's what we need to test. So, again, we have a guest. We put a towel on the sunbed, then we put the guest on the sunbed, and this has to work out. Let's see if it does. Oops. Um, wrong tab. Oh, let's get rid of test docs, that's more readable then. Wait, that's green, cool. Works. But now we have to look at the other part, right? Because there is a Boolean method. So whenever there's a method returning a bo uh, sorry, there's a method returning a Boolean value, to be more exact. Whenever we have a method that returns a Boolean value, we need at least two tests to make sure that it works, because otherwise we can just cheat by always returning true or false, and nobody will ever notice. So, let's try to come up with another test. Um, guest who reserved sunbed can occupy it, cannot be occupied by other guest. So, we reserve it with a towel, we occupy it by a guest, and then that needs to be a, re a false result. <laughs> Obviously, that's exactly the same code, so we can already tell that something's going to be wrong with that, 
and is of course not going to work out. Why? Well, this is the problem that if you have been to the pool, there is a booth at the side of the pool where you can borrow one of those towels. I guess they have a million of those and they all look the same. Now, you put your towel on the sunbed. Ten minutes later I walk by and say, oh, there is my towel and my sunbed. We have a problem of object identity here. If you're ever looking for a good explanation of object identity, think of towels on a sunbed. If they all look the same, how do you possibly know that this is your towel and not mine, or vice versa? It, it's really bad. So if you use your private towel, which has a funny image on it, which is probably rather unique, at least rather unique today in this hotel, it's not globally unique, but in this hotel you're the only one having that fancy towel, you can put it there and everybody's going to know that that's not my towel because my towel looks different. It's still not a globally unique identifier. In that case, identifier is a pattern matching algorithm. Um, well, you could, you could argue that those are not exactly the same, but running a pattern matching on the stitches will probably be very crazy, so that's not viable, let's face it. So, for the sake of building what we are building here, we need to figure out a way of associating a towel with a guest. Some relation, right? It has to be your towel. Now, there is various ways um, we can do that in the real world, and there is various ways we can do that in technology, in code, and they basically don't really relate for now. So what we are doing now is not going to work in the real world. I'm very, I'm very aware of that. But let's just, uh, it's a model, so technically we can, we can go with that. So, um, if this is this guy's or lady's towel, well then, we can actually um, add some code here that um, allows us to check whether the right person is, going, is trying to occupy the sunbed. Now, let's just quickly sneak that in. So, we have a guest. Let's create a constructor. And that's all for now. No, we, pr we probably need a getter. I try to avoid get when writing getters. That's just a personal preference. Um, so I'll just name the method guest. Um, you could name it get guest if you feel more comfortable with that. Now the towel knows which guest it belongs to. And now what we can do, well, the test is still going to fail. Yeah, and there's complaints that towel construct it doesn't work, so we have to fix our constructor calls because we now need the towel to be associated with a guest, right? And let's fix that. You see why it pays off to execute the tests frequently because now this is a separate step and I can do that before continuing. Now I've done it, let's continue. Okay, so we still have that test failing, great. Let's see what we can do in the occupy by. Um, if this is reserved, then we want to make sure that if the towel the guest the towel belongs is not this guest. And again, it's not the perfect code that I'm writing now. I just want to make it work for now, and then we can discuss what to improve. Um, 
So if this is not the correct guess, then we'll throw a towel exception. I've always wanted to do that. Throw a new towel exception. You also use those um, in a boxing match, I believe. So let's create the towel exception quickly. Ah, I forgot my... That should do. So we have a towel exception. We need to dump a new auto loader. And that still does not work. Okay, now I'm confused. Let's see. We have our sunbed test. Of course it doesn't work because it's the same guest. So we need a different guest here. Okay, guest. And another guest. And this towel belongs to the other guest. And this towel reserves the sunbed, and then we'll try to occupy it. And that's not a, an assert false, but that's technically a expecting an exception. There you go. Hoo -hoo. Okay, let's just confirm that things actually work out. Now, if we are not throwing that exception, this test should fail. It does. If we screw up that condition, at least this test should fail, and another one should fail, because there is a towel exception now where there shouldn't be one. So pretty much anything that we can um, do wrong will be caught. Now, we have a nested if, that's at least four execution paths in this method, and we don't have four tests covering that. So, I think technically, we might have somebody trying to occupy um, a sunbed that is not reserved. Do we have a test for that? Yes, can be occupied if it's not reserved. We have that. Looking good. Okay. Well, perfect. Um, so, who thinks that those small and little objects are cool? Or does, does anybody feel like, well, I don't know, you really want to create that many small objects? What's your take on that? It's fine? Okay. I think they are incredibly useful because they are essentially the building blocks of your business logic, right? Um, if you view, if you think in data, then your main problem is gonna be how do I validate this data? So let's take a simple example, um, a guest ID, right? In a legacy piece of software, the guest ID might be an integer. Why? Because it's the auto-increment index of your guests table in your MySQL database. And that's an integer. Um, so technically, you have an implementation detail dictating you how your guest ID looks like. I don't think this is a good design choice, but anyway, in most existing legacy systems, it would be that way. So an auto-increment index is an integer, but it's a positive integer. It can be negative. If I pass a value from the outside as part of an HTTP request, I want to do something to the guest with this ID, I can pass in a crap value, a string, a negative integer, for example. And if you try to work with that, that's not gonna work out. So what are you going to do? Yeah, of course, you're going to validate the value, right? Okay, let me quickly come up with another example to show that. So, um, Example of PHP. Let's say find guest by ID and you have a guest ID and then whatever. Now you can say, well, this is an integer, PHP 7, thank you. Okay, and you're going to return a guest if you find it. 
perfect. Um, so we might still want to make sure that the integer is positive. Okay, if guest ID is smaller than zero, yeah, I think zero is a valid ID, but I I can I can give in to that, no problem. We're we're getting there. We're getting there, but slowly. Yes, that that's exactly the point. Now, okay. How often are you going to use a guest ID in your application? Probably 50 times or 100 times. You have two choices. Either you are passing around an unvalidated value, which means you put that somewhere. Some people try to put that up very, very early and validating the input when it comes from the HTTP request and then just pass the value on. But anybody else either needs to trust that somebody has already validated the data and that nobody has changed it since, or they have to revalidate. So in fact, you either have a very unreliable application or you get, you get code duplication. You have 50 times this guard clause around your application. Now, if your boss enters the room and says, we are using that fancy new NoSQL technology, which does not have auto-increment indexes anymore, but we're gonna use UUIDs for that now, you're not going to have a good day because you need to change 50 occurrences in the code, right? That's bad. So, Let's try to get rid of that code duplication. And again, the trick is, let's have a small value object encapsulating that ID. So that would be a guest ID object. And has a constructor. I can generate that. We pass in the guest ID. And um, we just memorize it. Private ID, that's an int. And I like to have an as int method. You know that in PHP 7.4, we, we're probably going to get typed properties. So if that's an int, you can attach the fact that it's an int to the property, which is, is going to be really cool. Um, so that's our guest ID. And now I can replace that by a guest ID. And I don't need that anymore. Now I have this in one place. Now the fact that guest ID is an integer has become an implementation detail of that object. That's a fundamental of the D in solid, the dependency inversion that states do not depend upon details. And integer being a detail, we now have an abstraction and you're supposed to depend upon abstractions. Guest ID is an abstraction. We depend on guest ID up there, line five, no dependency on int, but dependency on guest ID. Now we can change the fact that we have an int and use an UUID now, that's just changing the guest ID implementation. Plus, the other big advantage is, we have a self-validating object, namely guest ID. If the data is not valid, we cannot instantiate the object in the first place, so we have no way of passing around an invalid guest ID. That means once we have validated it by creating the object, we can pass the object around and we know we are working with sane data. That's why you want to encapsulate your stuff in those small objects. Those are the smallest building blocks of your domain model. And if a sunbed, you know, can be occupied, can be reserved, whatnot, yeah, that's fundamentals of a sunbed. Yes, they may change at some point if Thomas Cook comes up with that new thing where you put a sign on and then maybe that's a new behavior. 
that we write, have to write new code for. But um, funny enough, the real world tends to change rather slowly, right? A sunbed is going to be pretty much the same next year. So there is no reason of being afraid that this object uh, is not flexible enough. You also don't have to generalize it. And again, and we are not going to do that as part of the, the exercise um, after the coffee break, focus on the behavior of the object. Don't look at the state. If you ask the question, how do I test getters and setters, you're asking a wrong question because you want to assert the state of an object, which is not the best thing to do because an object is much more than something encapsulating data. An object is behavior, right? We don't really care too much about how the object internally decides whether there is a towel on it or whether it's occupied by a guest. That's implementation details. The behavior is we can reserve it, we can occupy it, and there are certain things we can't do. Because obviously, if you have not reserved it with your towel, you cannot sit on it. There's going to be an exception. The application does not allow this to happen. It protects an invariant, if you want to have a fancy way of saying that. Essentially, um, and I know it's hard to believe, but essentially there's most of what domain modeling is about and object-oriented development in essence as it was meant to be is all that we've seen in this example. There is no more to it. I can give you a funny story. We frequently do PHP unit related stuff, obviously Sebastian being one of my business partners. And if we show how to use PHP unit, after one or two hours, usually somebody's going to say, okay, so I got what you have showed us to this point. Now, when do we get to the nitty gritty? And the answer is never. Because if your code is not as simple as that and can be tested as easily as that, then your code has a problem. It's not a problem on the PHP unit side. You don't want to get into the nitty gritty. You want to write your code so that it's easily testable. There is basically three things when it comes to testing. One is testing return values. We've done that, assert true, assert false. Second is testing exceptions. We've done that. We are ex asserting that an exception takes place. And the third thing we have not seen yet, that is testing object interactions. I want to make sure that my object calls a method on another object. Right? That's where stubbing and mocking and all that stuff comes in. We don't necessarily have to do that today. Maybe we'll get there depending on you know, how we progress. Um, and that's it. Anything else? All those weirdnesses? No, you don't. So a typical example, what people sometimes do or try to do is, well, I have a constructor that initializes my object. right? Now I have an object and I have to make sure that all the properties are set correctly. So I'll either need getters or I need to use black magic and use reflection to look, look into the object. If you do that, you're breaking encapsulation. You are depending, your test is depending on an implementation detail. It's, test, it's depending on the fact that there is a property of a certain name. If you change that, your test is going to break. So that's a fragile test and it's a bad test because, well, if I change the implementation, the test is going to break. I want the test to be stable to tell me that if the behavior of the object is correct, test is still green. That's the difference of testing behavior, testing API versus testing implementation. So a lot of how good testing works can be learned by discussing the question, should we test getters and setters? My answer to that question is no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't write setters in the first place because your value objects need to be immutable. I'll, I'll give you an explanation for that in a second. And I don't like getters because getters expose state and the more getters I have, the more locked into keeping state in the object I have and it gets harder to change around. There are certain places where you have a typical DTO if you load something from the database. If you want to wrap that in an object to pass it on, that's a DTO. 
if you encapsulate a command, that's a DTO. If you have an HTTP request represented as an object, that's a DTO. In those cases, it's an object that merely exists to transport data. But all the other objects, they're about behavior. Now, immutability of value object. Who's familiar with that? Okay, so I have to run a brief explanation because that's a very important. What's a value object? First of all, we have Scala values in PHP. We all know them. Int, um, string, float, bool. Um, if you pass a Scala value in PHP, PHP is going to, cr to make a copy, right? I have a string, I pass a string to a function. The function can do whatever it wants to the string, to the variable, because that's a local variable in the scope of the function. And it's not gonna affect my string. Technically, that's because PHP has made a copy. If you get down to the nitty gritty, PHP has not even made a copy unless you modify it, but that's an implementation detail. It's called copy on write. PHP is very, very clever with that. Now, if you have an object, you do not copy the object. PHP 4 used to do that. That's why we had to put the ampersands everywhere, which was really crazy. Anybody back in that time, anybody remembers that? Yeah. Forget one ampersand, two days of debugging. Been there, done that. It was, it was not funny. So, um, you pass around an object, technically you're passing around a reference. That means, if I create something that represents a Scala value, like 20 Euro, it's technically like a Scala value, but it's an object because it contains two pieces of information, 20 and Euro. So it makes sense to create an object for that. So that's a so-called money object. Now, if I create an object like that, if it were a Scala value, what would happen is, I pass it to him, we'll make a copy, he gets the copy, and I'll even give you a pen so you can modify the value if you like. I have my copy. I don't really care what he does with his copy, okay? That's call by value. Now let's look at call by reference. I have my 20 euro. So, did you change it? Okay. You, you get to change this one. Now this is an object. An object is being passed by reference. So you can touch it. You have a reference to this object, but I also have a reference to this object. So I'll keep my fingers on that one. Now if he changes the value, please do that. Now it's 22. I suddenly have 22 euros in my hand, but I was expecting to have 20. That's bad. This is why value objects must be immutable. There are no methods that change the state of this object, that change the values, because otherwise weird, weird things happen because we are passing by reference. What does this mean? It's actually pretty simple. We can have a method in this money object that says add, and add to. And then he's going to get a new instance. And this is new, his new instance. Now he has his own instance. I have mine. And we can, do, we can go separate ways. So that's very, very, very important that value objects are immutable. It's, it's a good idea to keep objects as immutable as possible anyway. Because mutable state always causes problems. Um, immutable objects are really cool. If you can keep your object stateless, do. Of course, stuff like the sunbed is a clearly stateful object because it can be reserved, it can be occupied, so there is clearly state associated with that. Now, the, 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 the big other thing op as opposed to value objects that people talk about is an entity. What is an entity? That's something that has an identity. <laughs> Does a sunbed have an identity? No. Yeah, it could, but usually it doesn't. I mean, you have 25 sunbeds at the pool, you don't know which one is which. And I don't really care if that's the one I had yesterday, if that's the exact one, just give me one. So, on a day-to-day -day basis, sunbeds probably have no identity. 
Another great example is uh, money, like a 10 euro bill. To me, it has no identity. If I give it to you and you give me another 10 euro bill, it's still 10 euros, so I don't really care too much. Of course, looking at that from another point of view, if you're a central bank that has an identity because it has a serial number and it's very important to you, so maybe our sunbeds do in fact have a serial number somewhere. And in some context, we might care about that. In other contexts, not. If you ever heard about the term bounded context, that's a domain-driven design a terminology thing, that's essentially what bounded contexts are. Different ways of looking at things and they are modeled differently. So whether money is a value object or an entity purely depends on the type of application that you're building. If you're a central bank, it's probably gonna be an entity. If it's just money that you're passing around, it's probably gonna be a value object. And essentially, we all had this problem in our simple example with the towels, right? Does a towel have an identity? Hmm, is it the same towel? Is it the identical towel or just one that looks the same? And do we really care? Towels probably don't have an identity. Um, in my experience, people tend to focus too much on an object identity. Um, you're, you're far better off if you can just work with value objects and say, you know, if I don't care about the identity of something, then I don't have to manage the identity and ensure uniqueness and all that. So simple value objects serve many, many purposes. And um, again, it's the small build, small building, the smallest building block of your domain logic. Um, you should really um, get into using them. And something else that I've already said before, persistence. Yeah, I don't really care too much about persistence. Um, figuring out a way of persisting a sunbed. Well, that's something that's a separate concern. We can do that. Um, I don't really have to deal with all the objects separately because um, you'll probably not want to persist a towel or a guest on their own. Why would you, right? Classical database-centric applications, usually you can load every object by its own and then load all the related objects, which opens up a plethora of fun with the n plus one problem and many database round trips and stuff like that. Um, usually, it's sufficient to load a working set of objects, an aggregate. The sunbed is an aggregate. It's made of different objects, right? Um, and together they make sense, together they can be used in one use case, but I don't want to use the guest or the towel separately not in the context of this application, maybe in another application. Question is whether that needs to be the same code then, or maybe that's a separate service, microservice application component, whatever. Um, and the, the sunbed as an aggregate contains everything it needs to know to make the business decisions for certain use cases. That's your working set. So usually you're gonna have a repository to load that aggregate from. So that's in a nutshell pretty much all the domain-driven design, tactical design patterns that you should have heard of and you should be using. Um, I know that Eric Evans is not fun to read, but it's a very valuable resource, so every developer once in his lifetime should really work through domain-driven design, the blue book. Who's read it? Nobody, really? You have, oh, my savior. <laughs> okay. It's, it's, it's difficult to understand. Um, it it go, goes back to 2003, so, well, and Eric is a great guy, but um, he's not, um, some of, he's not the best explainer with some of the concepts. He can explain them much better today, but the book is older. Um, Anyway, 
I would urge anybody to look into that. If you think that this is a valuable approach, starting with the small objects, building blocks and stuff, then essentially the tactical domain-driven design patterns um, should be your next step um, to look into. Now, going back to, um, I said that this is pretty much all you need to know um, almost. Well, there are certain things like interfaces, abstract base classes. There are a few things that are kind of missing that we haven't touched upon now. Um, and I don't even know if we're going to touch upon them in the exercise. But other than that, um, it doesn't take more. That's the fun part. All the possibilities, all the things you can do in PHP, you don't have to. The best application is very simple and straightforward. The best code is not the fancy code that nobody understands, but is the piece of code that leaves no trace of a doubt what it does. That's essentially your own, your only quality um, criteria you should use. If I look at some piece of code, will I have questions about it? And if you have questions about it, then the code is not good enough, period. Code must be written in a way that it leaves no trace of a doubt. Yeah? I'm sorry, probably it's a, probably a good time to fix that nested permutations in, in, our, in our code. Ah, okay. We can do that. What's your suggestion how to fix it? Okay, so first of all, we have green tests. Good. Let's try this. Oops. Yes, and all sunbed. What? Aha. <laughs> the thing is, if it's if it's uh, not reserved, then then towel is null. <laughs> so. Um, That's why can we switch uh, the orders? So. Yeah, like this. Yeah. Okay. In here? Mm. According to PHP unit, we cannot do that. Ah, um, no, we cannot return now, but we can return. Okay, so. Um, well, guess to reserve Sunbed can occupy it. It, it changed the behavior. So if it's not reserved, then we'll set the guest, but we cannot set the guest before we have done that check. And the thing is that there is, if it's not reserved, then we don't have a towel. We can't do this. So what we can do maybe is, let's put that above. Let's first say if this No, that's not, it's not going to get more pretty, is it? Um, let's try to fix it how and let's just see if that works better. No, okay. Okay, so um, let's Let's go back to where we came from until the tests were green. 
and then let's add explaining methods. I think this is the state where, no. Okay, this is the state where everything worked out. So, um, this ensure Get rid of this. Maybe that should be same guest. Okay. Now, would that qualify as getting rid of the nested condition? Certainly, yeah. Um, the the thing is, we have um, we have two different um, pieces of state, right? We have the reservation and the occupation, so we will have some nesting in checking those conditions, which we cannot get rid of. In a simple case. What you would usually do is, um, instead of nested conditions, use a guard clause. And so invert the condition, put it up front, and then either return or throw an exception. And then at the end of the method, without indentation, you have the actual, that's what I expect case. So that's usually, I, I perceive that as much more readable than the nested clauses. Um, in that case, it's not that easy um, to get rid of. But funny enough, um, with, even with that small refactoring we tried, it's very helpful to have the tests that tell you, uh, no, no, that didn't work. If you if we had, didn't have those, those tests, well, we'd probably have introduced a bug right now. Okay, um, is there anything else we need to do to this code? Because it's a uh, coffee break is coming up. Yeah. We're still reserving that one more time. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good point. We can put multiple, well, we actually, we can replace the towel there. So we can steal somebody else's reservation. That's a very good one. We are missing a test. Test. Cannot be reserved twice. And at some point, we'll probably need an unreserve method <laughs> because otherwise uh, we'll never get the towels off the things. So we have a towel belonging to the guest that reserves the sunbed. And now I'm using the towel exception again. So I can reserve it once, but I cannot reserve it twice. Uh, I don't really care whether it's the same person or another person, because if you already have your towel on it, there is no, it doesn't make sense to, again, put your towel on it. But we could even make that more clear by saying, well, that's, def that's clearly another person, new towel. New guest. Ah, I was talking of guests rather than persons. I should have talked about guests. So, let's see. Fails. There you go. Um, and so this is another guard clause. Ensure not reserved. Sorry. Didn't catch that. Oh, yeah, thank you. I was ju just trying to make sure everybody pays attention. It was a deliberate mistake, of course. <laughs> um, this towel, no. Mm. 
Okay, there we go. Now we cannot reserve it twice. And that's probably more hidden. Um, we, we certainly need to unreserve, um, and we need to leave. I mean, if we occupy, we also need to be able to leave uh, the sun ban at some time. So um, I will actually take that code and, and push it um, to GitHub. So um, if, you, if you're bored at some point in time, you can take the code and play with it. But um, we're going to have another fun example, uh, which is not about sunbeds, after the coffee break. So for something different, I'm not endorsing any lottery or gambling per se. I just think it makes a good example. So we're going to build a lottery now. Let's um, quickly go through what we're up to. So um, I don't know if you guys have heard from that. It's uh, like a European lottery where you can will win millions and millions. Currently it seems to be at 61 million, so if you ever were bored with your day job, there you go. Um, this is from, from Wikipedia, and again, I'm trying to put the focus on rules, as in business rules and behavior, rather than viewing what we build as data. So we have a jackpot, and you pay two euros per line, which is kind of irrelevant for what we are going to build. Um, you have five numbers from one to 50 and two supplementary numbers from one to 10. Your chances of winning are one in 95 million. There are 12 tiers of prizes and they draw every Friday evening in Helsinki. And this is um, how the winning tiers have looked like uh, last week. So nobody took the 49 million. Uh, two winners are millionaires now, and you can like goes down to like eight euros and twenty. So it depends on how many numbers you guessed correctly. Just like any lottery, you would you would know and imagine. So if um, we try to get clear on the terms, it's funny enough. Wikipedia says, well, a lottery it's a form of gambling. We know that gambling is a sin, anyway. Um, funny enough, if you look at their website, they're gonna say you, no, no, it's a lotto, not a lottery. And I have to admit, I didn't know the difference. And this happens to me very frequently. When I work with teams and companies, they're gonna say, you know, this is, uh, there are very subtle differences, or this is something that's really different from what you thought it would be. So a lotto basically has a jackpot, and a lottery doesn't. And that's at least what I got from this text. So even a term like lottery, where everybody thinks they are really clear on what it means, there may be subtleties that may or may not be important at some point. So let's talk terminology. This is usually what you get. The user makes a bet. Now, who knows the movie Tron? We all know that users do not exist. They are a myth, right? Um, whenever I hear a sentence containing the word user, I tense it up. Because what is a user? Really, nobody speaks of a user. Have you ever gone to a supermarket and hear them talk about users? No, they have customers, they have clients, they have shoppers but they don't have users. Um, so, to be clear on terminology, you always have to ask questions, what exactly is that? What does it do? How does it behave? Which rules does it follow? So, some of the terminology for what we're going to work on, those are quotes from the website, basically describing things. And a large part of what domain-driven design um, tries to teach us is we want to have a ubiquitous language that's a common language between the business and the developers. So don't come up with your own terms, but 
use the same terms that the business does, which also means you have to understand those terms in the first place. That sounds like boring and picky, but you have to get really clear on that stuff. So some of those terms are probably going to be important. Let's play nouns and verbs. Usually the nouns are likely to become classes. It's not 100% like that, but most of the time nouns are going to be classes. Um, verbs are going to be methods. So those are nouns that may be good candidates for class names. And you may notice that there are no controller, service, manager, or whatever postfixes or any prefixes or any weirdnesses. Because we don't want to have any artificial technical crap polluting our beautiful domain, right? That's the terminology we want to use because every domain expert uses this language and every customer is going to use this language. So if we stick to using this language, we will ultimately be able to come up with a test docs out of PHP unit that literally says what the application does for everybody to be, to, to be understood. And this is exactly what we want to achieve. So those are candidates for methods. There are not too many of them right now. Um, but that's just like a basic thing. Go with the descriptions. Get clear on the terms. So how do you do that? Well, how do you discover the business rules? One way is asking. Usually you have to do that five times. You're going to say, did you tell me everything about the system? No. Yes, sure. If you ask half an hour later, oh, no, wait, we forgot that. And three days later, oh, wait, 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 there is more. It takes quite a few iterations. And what I have learned as a consultant, there is no trivial domain. Right? Domain-driven design always says, well, you need a non-trivial domain. It needs to be uh, rather complex so that it's fun. Hey, we were, we were discussing a sunbed earlier today, and the sunbed proved to be pretty complex. Something as simple as a sunbed. I say there are no trivial domains. If you look down into the nitty-gritty, there's always um, things to explore and to discover. Look at the state transitions. How does somebody become a customer? It's a most interesting question to ask in your business. When is somebody a customer? Are they a customer when they visit your website? Are they a customer when they place an order? Are they a customer when they have received an order? Are they a customer when you have, when you have received the money? Very interesting question. Ask the business, you'll probably get all those different answers, because everybody has a different um, connotation with these terms. State the obvious. What may be totally obvious for you, or for domain experts, for you being familiar with the business you're working in, is totally non-obvious to somebody else. Like this. They didn't put that explicitly somewhere on the website. Well, it's technically it's there. You have to be 18 to participate. Maybe that's obvious. Maybe that's implicit. It's certainly something that um, is going to affect our design. Maybe we have to have an age verification if we build a software for that. Maybe we don't. Find implicit rules. Sometimes implicit and obvious, I think that's, that's, it's hard to even distinguish between the two. Um, implicit rules might be, we only accept bets until a certain deadline. You, you clearly cannot bet on yesterday's drawings. Yeah, still we have to make that implicit. Uh, sorry, we have to make that explicit and we have to agree on a deadline at some point. We cannot draw the same number twice. Right? They do the little balls, they, they shake them around, and then they take one out. So it's gone. So you can't take the same ball twice. If we use a random number generator, that's something we have to account for. You can't draw the same number twice. You probably also can't bet the same number twice. 
would be, at least it would be stupid. Because it would be, maybe it's an invalid bet, I don't know. Maybe that's a terminology that we even need to get clear on. Numbers are not zero-based. That's something that computer scientists and the rest of the world never be, seem to be able to agree on, right? You cannot bet on zero. It starts with one. Okay. Doesn't hurt to make it explicit. And, and something more business-like, maybe we have a random number generator that needs to be certified. You can't just play lotto with a random jump number generator that nobody knows how it works because... Mm, well, there is money involved, like 49 million, 61 million, 90 millions, all those numbers that we've already seen. You certainly want to be sure that nobody tampers with the random number generation. And we know that what we call random number generation, depending on the implementation of the generator, is just a sequence that's predictable by default. If you choose the same random seed, you're going to get the same results. And you clearly do not want that to happen so that some developer, admin, or bad guy is able to predict the lottery. Um, and that might affect implementation quite a bit. We will, of course, completely ignore that for the purposes of this exercise, but just so that um, we have something, some little things to work with here, some little ideas. Now, TDD, I'm not going to introduce TDD Broadly, I'm just going to give you the very, very nutshell version. DDD is about writing the test first. Why is that interesting or important? Because it basically, what I'm, what I'm, I'm trying to, I to put it that way. You, you assume the software is already there. And you play a wishful game, is, oh, this is how I would use the software. I would like to have a method of this name and I would call it like that and then I would expect it to return that. That's what you wish for and this is what you put in the test. And then obviously this test fails because the code does not exist. Now you run the code, run the test and there's gonna be an error message which is not bad. It's an error message that you have to perceive as your impulse because PHP unit in that case is gonna tell you what to do next. And this is why it's called test-driven. You let the tests drive your development. You think of what you want, and then you go in very, very, very small baby steps. And basically, you can shut your brain down and just let the tests drive your development. And I think this is incredibly productive because you, um, you sort of go back and forth between wearing multiple hats, more on that um, later as we get into coding. But um, you have that separation of thinking about the API. This is how I want to use the thing. And then thinking about the implementation in a separate step. And separating that mentally, that's the big gain. Traditionally, you would build a structure of objects and then have loads of objects that can do loads of things. And then you have a really crappy API that everybody hates and nobody likes to use. TDD inverts that by letting you define the API first and forcing you to define the API first. And then there's that separation of API and implementation. That's the beauty of TDD. We always have a red-green refactor cycle. So you always start with a red test, you execute the test and you know it's going to fail, it fails, it's going to tell you what to do next. You can really do that in very, very small baby steps initially and for today I would suggest you try that. And then in real life your steps are naturally going to become a little bigger. Once your test is green, you're done. That again is the beauty of TDD. It tells you when you are done. Main problem of why software development is always over time and over budget is because no developer ever knows when to stop. Oh, let's build that into the software and maybe next year we're gonna need that. And you know, there's a weird edge case and I'm sure we should build that into the software. You never know when to stop. Usually there is somebody who has to take it away from you and say, we are going to ship it now. I remember when I was young, that was really tough on me, like my boss coming and said, we are going to ship now. 
And I said, no, I, I, we are going to ship now. Okay. Um, TDD tells you when you're done. So you only write as much code as you need to make the test green. And the code doesn't even have to be pretty. Because once you have a green test, you can refactor. Since you have tests for everything that you wrote in functionality to this time, if you refactor and the tests are still green, that tells you your software still works. Otherwise, one or more tests are, are going to turn red, just as it happened to us before we bake. You know, well, I screwed up something. That's incredibly valuable. Because when you go home in the evening, you know that the piece of software that you've built actually works. Plus, tests and production code are like two sides of an equation. Right? If you only work on one side, on the production code side, and refactor the code without touching the tests, if they keep green, your refactoring hasn't broken anything. You're only allowed to refactor on green. That's traditional TDD. We are not talking about dealing with legacy code. That's a different story. They usually you don't have tests, so that's another story we are not going to cover today. But for the greenfield thing that we are going here, that we're going to do here, red green refactor. And you don't have to refactor in every step. You only refactor when you feel like, whoa, that's really ugly, or maybe that should be somewhere else because it doesn't fit into that class, it needs to go there, or that's too big. So the typical reasons for refactoring. Um, when it comes to code duplication, if you see code duplication, you are more than welcome to refactor to get rid of the code duplication, but you have to see it first. So don't refactor because you think there is going to be code duplication in the future. Do not generalize, just don't do that. The thing is, with a decent test coverage, you have a safety net, so you can change your code. One of the reasons why, um, why we have many problems that we have with all the legacy applications is because we are afraid of, if we don't put it in the software now, we're going to do weird things as we put it in later. We're going to break the software, or we will not be able to put it in. If you have tests covering your software, you can always put in anything. You can extend anything, and if you break something, the tests are going to tell you. So you don't have to be afraid of extending the software later. And this is exactly one of the big advantages. You can work with that and say, hey, I'm just going to build a minimal piece of software now, and I can extend it later if I have to. There is a safety net of tests telling me that the functionality is still there. Okay, emerging design, we do not design up front, period. We do not. You just make it work, and then you make it pretty through refactoring. And the design is going to emerge. You're going to look at things like, is this a single responsibility class? Is this behavior that belongs into this class? Oh, we have a train wreck where I'm calling methods in another object, so maybe that method should move over to the other object. There are various ways of detecting how and where to refactor, but you don't have to design up front. And that's incredibly valuable because step one, you can start building a use case. You don't have to come up with 25 objects and relations and persistence and whatnot. You can focus on the use case. I have very often seen in exercises and also in real life teams that would spend a whole sprint setting up a ginormous infrastructure of things and you would look at, so what does it do? Yeah, well, it doesn't do anything, but now we are at the point where we can start building the functionality that we need. Well, I better be at that point in minute one, right? Let's start with the functionality and let everything else emerge. And TDD helps you do that. You need to execute tests frequently and your tests need to be really fast. They need to be way faster than one second because even waiting one second gets on your nerves. So this naturally tells you that your test suite cannot talk to any external systems, databases and, and stuff. 
Um, it needs to be a pure unit test suite. There will be tests that take longer, but you're not going to execute them on a regular basis. Um, you can filter and execute individual tests, but with a bunch of tests, you should be done with, say, uh, a third of a second. And this is quick enough to do some coding, run the tests, look at the results, go back to coding. Usually, you would expect... So when I'm, when I'm doing TDD and I haven't run the tests for, say, five minutes, I get really nervous. You should run the tests basically every other minute. If you write a line of code, uh, if you write a line of code execute the tests. Okay, so you should have that appliance thingy, and I have admittedly never looked at that. I was just before coming here, I was on vacation in South Africa, and while I was literally in the bush, they said, and now you need to test the appliance, and it's just a four gigabyte download, which for me was not possible at the time. So um, I have that repo where I put the code in today. Um, so you need to find that directory, you need to run a git pull, then you build an autoloader and then you can run PHP unit and it should give you a uh, um, decent result. And then there is one test and one class that's tested for you um, to look at and to start with. You should take some time to familiarize yourself with that, maybe play around with it. And your first task is gonna be based on the numbers, w build the Euro numbers, which is rather similar than numbers, so you can sort of take a peek at what is there and do some mental copy paste adapt if that helps you. Generally the idea is you have a bunch of tests and they are all commented out and they have a hashtag number. And I'm sort of giving you the tests that drive your development um, the way you should work is uncomment the test with the lowest number that's commented out, run the test, it should fail, make a test green. If you need to refactor, refactor, then continue on with the next test. It's going to be uh, increasingly difficult, uh, so the initial test is going to have um, everything and then there's just going to be the methods and then it's going to be, it's going to become more and more coarse grained. Don't worry um, if you don't make it through the exercise. There is no sh such thing as completing the exercise. It's about working with the stuff. I'll be walking around if you have any questions. Um, wave and I'll stop by. Um, it doesn't matter how far you get. It matters how much you learn. Um, you learn most by discussing with your neighbor. If you feel like that, ask any questions to me if you have. Other than that, um, enjoy building the lottery. I guess I'll take off the microphone now because uh, if you have private conversations, it doesn't really make sense to have that on the PA. Since there are, Since there are two different ways of creating the object, um, I need two constructors and I can't have constructor overloading in PHP, that's one reason. The other reason, rarely known, you can actually explicitly call the constructor multiple times. So you can create an object with new, you can work with the object, and then at any given point in time, you can explicitly call underscore underscore construct again and screw up the whole object. There is actually an RFC um, to disallow that in PHP because there is no valid insane use case, but technically it makes your immutable objects mutable because you can screw up the state by calling the constructor again. That's your argument for making the constructor private in the first place. <coughs> <coughs>